Good evening. Uh, I am Mary Canning. I'm the president of the Royal Irish Academy. And we are delighted to welcome you all this evening to the Academy for our discourse. Um, also present this evening is uh, the Academy Secretary, Professor Mary O'Dowd. And joining us online is the Academy Treasurer, Professor Patrick Conaghan. Academy discourses are the oldest and most renowned series of talks in Ireland. The first discourses were presented in 1786, and they were set up really for academics to reveal and discuss their work in public. We now record these discourses, and they're available on the Academy's website. And before we begin, I have a small amount of Academy business to undertake. I would ask people to mute their phones if that would be uh, appropriate. Thank you very much. The minutes of our last discourse, Decoding the Past to Conserve Our Future, with Dr. Larissa DeSantis and Paul Giller, member of the Academy, took place on the 18th of July 2022 in University College Cork, and these were posted online since no member of the Academy advised us of any issues in relation to these minutes, I will take these as approved and I will sign the minute book at the end of these discussions. I would like to welcome our panel for this evening's discourse. They're all esteemed historians. And first of all, let me welcome Dr. Charlotte MacDonald, who is Professor of History at Victoria University in Wellington, Te Waka, Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, you're very welcome, Professor MacDonald. I know there's quite a difference in time between us. Uh, I gather it's tomorrow morning where you are, but it's very good of you to join us, uh, and we're all delighted to see you online. Uh, Professor MacDonald is a historian of modern New Zealand within the wider frameworks of empire and colony. She has long-standing research interests in the histories of women and gender. Also joining us online is Dr. Jochen Wurler. He is director of the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies, having previously worked at the German Historical Institute in Warsaw, at the Imre Kertesz College in Jena, and as acting chair for Eastern European history at the Frederick Schiller University in Jena. His research fields include two world wars, the Holocaust, nation building, and the history of violence. And you're very welcome as well, We're without such a huge uh, time change, I reckon. Um, with us this evening is Professor Mariani Nieme, Professor of International History at the Tampere University in Finland. Professor Niemi has led many comparative research projects on Northern European history, and she was team leader in the Finnish Center of Excellence of Historical Research, Rethinking Finland, 1400 to 2000. And you're very welcome here this evening. <clears throat> Professor Mary Daly, who is with us, is uh, America's Professor of History at University College Dublin and served for seven years as Principal of the University College Dublin College of Arts and Celtic Studies. Professor Daly was President of the Royal Irish Academy from 2014 to 2017. She is the author and co-author of numerous publications examining the history especially of 20th century Ireland. And since 2012, she has been a member of the Irish government's expert advisory group on the decade of centenaries. And lastly, but not least, of course, chairing this evening's discussion, we have Professor Robert Gervarth, member of the Royal Irish Academy, Professor of Modern History in University College Dublin, and director of the UCD Center for War Studies. And his published work focuses on early to mid 20th century European history with a particular focus on the history of violence. Following the discussion, we will have the opportunity for some questions from our audience. 
and from those of you who are joining us online. And so now to the discourse, and Professor Gerwart, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, President, for this extremely uh, generous introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to chair uh, tonight's um, discourse, which brings together uh, four, as we just heard, four very distinguished uh, historians uh, working on very different aspects of state formation, uh, ranging all the way from uh, New Zealand to Poland to Finland and indeed Ireland. Uh, so what we will do is we will have four short interventions from these experts and then uh, I will start the conversation between us, hopefully revealing uh, something that I'm particularly interested in, the comparative aspects of uh, our national histories that we'll be looking at uh, this, uh, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, and then, of course, I will open the floor both to the audience that is present, uh, but if you are uh, online, uh, you can submit your questions. Uh, I have a little iPad here so I'll be able uh, to read them. I can't promise that all of the questions uh, will be answered, uh, but I will try to bundle them together uh, in a way that makes sense. And uh, obviously everyone is invited to, um, uh, to ask a question here within uh, the limits uh, of time. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to the interventions. We'll be uh, starting uh, in New Zealand. Uh, so Charlotte, um, the floor is yours. So I'm, I'm hoping you can see my screen and hear me and if you can't obviously please let me know. So um, good evening um, colleagues, friends, members of the Academy, uh, very warm greetings from the other side of the world. It's very good to be with you on this occasion. Uh, New Zealand, like Ireland, is a nation surrounded by sea and with a population in 2022 that is just over 5 million. There are, of course, linkages between us of people, of history, of an agricultural economy, of belief, of sport, and of course, 2022 marks a moment of jubilation for you and despondency for us <laughs> uh, with the Irish men's rugby team beating New Zealand All Blacks in a series for the first time on our home soil just a few weeks ago. But as nation states over the past century, perhaps our trajectories have been more divergent. There is a little slippage to say, as the blurb for this session does, that New Zealand joined the Commonwealth in 1926. New Zealand had been formally annexed as a colony of the British Empire in 1840, had a self-governing constitution from 1854, and became a dominion in 1907. So in 1926 at the Imperial Conference, um, the participants being seen here, uh, is the Balfour Declaration, which essentially puts the dominions on an equal footing with the United Kingdom, proclaiming dominions to be, and I quote, autonomous countries within the British Empire, equal in status. And on the left there is Gordon Coates, the New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, and on the right circled um, Cosgrave from the Irish Free State. Looking across the century from 1922 to 2022, I've identified four broad successes and three failures on a general arc that spans what I call dominion to decolonisation, noting that New Zealand's population is made up of a predominant white or Pākehā group, mostly descended from English, Scots, Welsh and Irish 19th century settler migrants, and a population of Indigenous Polynesian Māori, currently about 17% of the total population. So the successes uh, here, Social Security, a small state on the world stage, an inclusive parliamentary democracy, and addressing legacies of colonialism, the failures, a state built on that settler colonialism, a flawed relationship in the Pacific, and the fast growth of inequality. So addressing these extraordinarily briefly, um, First, the success of a welfare state uh, built largely between 1935 and 41 around income um, uh, uh, security, um, around uh, an expansive um, free uh, education system, so free education up to the age of 15, uh, an ambitious state housing program, and that welfare state continues by both major sides of the political spectrum for several um, decades. Uh, New Zealand 
has had a role, secondly, as a small but independent voice on the world stage. And although I don't want to overestimate the impact of that claim, I think it is significant to consider in terms of the aspirations and capacities of small states. So I would just point to two particular ways in which and points at which that uh, was evident. First, uh, at the end of World War II, New Zealand's wartime Prime Minister, Peter Fraser, was quite notable in the Charter Conference to the United Nations in 1945 in San Francisco, uh, where he became the leader of small nations opposing the veto rights granted to great powers, and indeed was extremely disappointed that those veto rights were retained by the five permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, and secondly, in the mid-1980s, at the height of the Cold War, New Zealand became uh, very uh, prominent, perhaps infamous in some parts of the world, uh, in speaking out against um, uh, nuclear weapons in particular. Uh, and it was a popular activist movement, of course, as it was in many parts of the world in the early mid-80s. But in New Zealand became particularly galvanised after the sinking of the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbour in mid-1985, uh, an act perpetrated by the French Secret Service, which was kind of not quite what you expect from allies. Uh, and then in mid-1986, when the United States effectively uh, threw New Zealand out of its main security alliance in uh, refusing to confirm or deny whether a visiting US warship was nuclear armed uh, or propelled. So unlike Ireland, New Zealand did not have a large global diaspora that might act as an echo or amplifier to such messages on an international stage. So I'm certainly not wanting to overestimate the influence or impact of these, but nonetheless to identify that particular element. Uh, thirdly, an inclusive parliamentary democracy. So New Zealand has um, a high level of voter participation. And of course, from 1893, when New Zealand became the first nation state in which women were able to vote particularly from 1996, when our system moved to proportional representation, there has been a significant broadening in the composition uh, of New Zealand's representatives in the parliament. Fourthly, and perhaps um, most significantly and most uh, evident in New Zealand at present, uh, is addressing um, our colonial legacy, so internal decolonisation. So, as I mentioned very briefly at the beginning, New Zealand was formally annexed as part of the empire in 1840, and part of that process was the negotiation of a treaty with over 500 rangatira, chiefs uh, of Māori tribes, the Treaty of Waitangi, which, although it was a very brief document, set up understandings and undertakings between those two parties, the Crown, Queen Victoria, and local residents. Uh, of course, those undertakings, perhaps not surprisingly, were rather swept aside in the tide of migration and in the pursuit of land by incoming settlers, leading to very substantial dispossession and marginalisation. So since the mid-1980s, perhaps particularly, there have been concerted efforts to address those challenges through the Waitangi Tribunal, a judicial body, and public agencies. So here is our current Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, speaking at Waitangi, uh, our national day in February 2018. And this is a particularly significant stage on which one hears that uh, addressing of the past in terms of policies uh, in the present, uh, sometimes uh, extreme, including very practical policies as well as uh, ones uh, about historical um, elements. So turning now to the failures very briefly, um, and again, you can see that the first one is sits on both sides of my list. So the great failure of the New Zealand state is that uh, throughout the 1922, 20, uh, 2022 period, it is a state built on, a, on that colonial past. Um, and over all of that time period, uh, Māori were seeking redress. So here, for instance, instance is a Ratna delegation to London in 1924, going to London to speak to the Crown uh, uh, in England because of the inadequacies of their answers from the local settler state. Uh, also, secondly, uh, the failure is in the Pacific, 
So New Zealand became both a colonial power as well as a colony, having responsibility for governing, if you like, the Cook Islands. And then from 1914, when Germany loses its Pacific Empire, um, uh, Western Samoa. And in its custody or in the fulfilment of those duties, uh, there were some very serious uh, lapses. So in, in Samoa in 1918, at the time of the flu, a ship was allowed in that caused extraordinary high levels of mortality, um, very um, negligently. And then uh, in 1929, um, there's an independence movement, the Mao movement, that was put down by New Zealand, uh, essentially uh, police with the loss of life including the leader of that Mao movement, uh, Tupua Tamasisi. And those left very deep, uh, if you like, stains and flaws in New Zealand's relationship uh, in the Pacific. Uh, thirdly, um, in terms of failures, is the very fast growth of inequality under neoliberalism from the mid-1980s, policies pursued by our both centre-left and centre-right parties, so somewhat unusually perhaps, uh, and that has led to very deep-seated inequalities uh, across the country. Like Ireland, a little later, New Zealand went from being a highly regulated economy to one which embraced free trade, open borders, more market and less government in a very short space of time. So the loss of manufacturing, the shrinkage of the public sector, the hollowing out of economic activity in many rural and regional towns and communities all have had a very serious social health and what we might now term well-being consequences. And you can see just on this brief gap and uh, graph in OECD rankings, New Zealand and Ireland actually quite close by each other uh, in terms of measures of uh, inequality in developed nations in the OECD. To end uh, this very brief presentation on a more general note, some, of course, of what I have identified will be features visible across other national communities. Yet they do work out and are lived out in very specific spaces. So globalisation may render the successes and failures of states less relevant, yet we continue to live in nationally designated political communities. And I am wary about globalisation being claimed as the new thing of the 21st century, when we know, if thinking about Ireland and New Zealand, for instance, that these are societies and nations formed by extremely powerful global forces of the mid to late 19th century, the era that saw Ireland become a place to leave from, and New Zealand one of the places people arrive to. So the outcomes of those decisions, those histories, remain with us in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, for this uh, extremely concise uh, introduction to the subject. Uh, I certainly learned a great deal as someone who specializes on uh, early 20th century uh, Germany, but uh, I think that you have already touched on a number of themes which uh, would probably be recurring uh, in some of the other um, presentations, uh, be it from the question of uh, decolonization slash de-imperialization, as many of the states were born out of empires that we'll be talking about today, uh, to gender inequalities and uh, equalities, uh, be they political or social, uh, social inequalities, uh, and other important themes that you have identified. Um, I would now uh, call on our second um, online speaker, um, my colleague and uh, friend and collaborator, Jochen Bühler, who's joining us uh, from Vienna. Thanks uh, for the invitation to the Royal Irish Academy. Thanks for the organization, uh, Passport Toto, for uh, Zoe Coleman and also for the Lensman team to participate here. And uh, I'm very happy to take part in this event. Um, I have been introduced already, and to not to take too much of my, my speaking time, I really try to stick to the to the 10 minutes or so. I would uh, just uh, dive into, into what I prepared for, for today. My talk is a little less uh, comparative as, as um, Charlotte's impressive presentation was. I'm really concentrating now during the next 10 minutes on Polish history, that during the last 100 um, years, 
And uh, I would um, uh, propose that we we look then after the fourth participation, where are the comparative aspects in my um, in my special um, case study. Um, and uh, because I, I guess that um, most of you are aware more or less with Polish history in general, but uh, some some uh, periods needs a little more clarification. I have um, uh, I have um, um, identified, of course, it's not very difficult. Four periods in the long twentieth um, century um, of Polish history, and I start, of course, with with the start of of what we are looking at here now, the independence in nineteen eighteen. And that period ended in Poland in 1939, as you know, the interwar period. I will then go on to examine uh, shortly um, the short six years, but, but uh, brutal six years of Second World War occupation in Poland. I then shed a light on the um, longer period of state socialism that lasted um, more than um, half a century, uh, no, no, more than 40 years in, in Poland. And then I will end with some words on the development since since um, Polish uh, second independence, as you, as, you, as you could argue, in 1989, 1990, and then uh, it's um, being member of the European Union since now almost 20 years. So, and what I'm concentrating on, I, I'm not going into so clearly uh, details of history and of social or political history of, of Poland. I'm rather, I was, I would like to talk in all those three or four periods on. Um, on three issues that, have, uh, as I would argue, always played a role even more than 100 years ago in Polish history, but they have been really prominent during the last 100 years. And this is uh, first independence or security issue, the issue of unity of the of the society or nation, and the issue of modernity. Um, and and I would I would now start with my first uh, the first period, the interwar period, 1918 to 1939. Uh, and it's uh, important to say only a few words on the time before, because otherwise it's not it's it's hard to understand. As as most of you will know, the Polish state did not exist from the late late uh, 18th to the early 20th century because it had been partitioned between the three powers: uh, Prussia, Germany um, on the one hand, Austria, and then on Russia and from Russia. And um, during this absence of, of the Polish state in the long 19th century, the Polish society had much diversified. The majority of the population, about 80%, was still toiling the land, while the numerous nobility was challenged by an ascending bourgeoisie, and industrialization was on its rise, but it lagged behind the breathtaking developments in England or Germany. Independence in 1918 was partly the achievement of the efforts of the soldiers, yeah, mostly peasants, that's important to note, on the battlefields of the post-war conflict, so not so much of the war itself, because they were fighting for the imperial powers that had partitioned Poland, but afterwards, what Robert has so prominently, prominently researched and written about in the post-war conflicts, the Polish peasants fought the Polish independence against Russia and against Germany, for example. And, um, and on the other hand, it was the achievement of the Polish uh, politicians, and the political camp was divided into the National Democrats on the one hand and the Socialists on the other hand. So, um, uh, in already in 1918, to sum it up, Poland faced three problems which should mark its destiny for the next 100 years and probably will mark it still in the future. The one is security, independence. Poland was in the interval period in a geopolitical deadlock because it was stuck between Russia and Germany. Unity was challenged because it had an internally divided society, especially polit politically between the nationalists and the universalists. So the nationalists were were really um, uh, 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 promoting a Polish national, ethno-national national state, and the universalists were rather voting for a more um, um, more multi-ethnic state integrating the minorities and the um, and these minorities that made part uh, about. Um, one third of the Polish population were also a problem. The ma majority of the ethnic Polish population and the minorities. It's something we could compare probably to New Zealand. And then we face a delayed modernity in a material sense because it has a smaller industry than its Western neighbors, but also because of the brutal destructions of the First World War and the millions of dead that had the war had brought. On the other side, all these three areas also face some positive developments. So 
Um, for 20 years in the interwar period, Poland was able to keep a politic of balance between Russia and Germany, so it was peaceful. Um, it the Polish society was divided inside, but but um, united against the enemy of Russia and Germany. And we have uh, developments in modernity, like for example, emancipation of women, that is far more developed there than in the West, for example. But also on the fields of literature, literature, music, fine arts, um, and also especially the contribution of the Polish Jewish minority. Second World War is a brutal rupture of this all, as you know, Poland is uh, occupied by Russia and Poland. So if it comes to the security or independence issue, it does not exist, of course, between 1939 and 1945. The Polish society is atomized. Uh, and uh, so because of the policies of both occupants, the Soviets and the Nazis of DVD and Impera, divide and Impera, and um, if it comes to modernity or education or the or the level of of of, uh, of of development in the in in the country because of the targeted killing of the Polish educated classes, especially by Soviets and by Nazis, um, uh, the, the the so, so the cultural and 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 development in other fields are are really put to a to a hold, and this is a shock that keeps um, the the Polish society still in its in its grip. I would say. So on the other hand, of course, it's hard to talk about anything positive if it comes to the Second World War. But at least we have a development if it comes to security or independence that the Polish um, underground state develops. So there is a state beyond the occupation which is well functioning and giving um, giving resistance to the Polish uh, to the German and the Soviet um, um, occupiers. Um, we have also, um, if it comes to the question of unity of the society, we have not only the atomization of the society, but we have also a diverse um, um, development that, for example, the non-Jewish um, population is coming to help to the Jewish population, which is uh, fa facing um, 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 uh, total um, elimination. And uh, yeah, if, if of modernity, I wouldn't wouldn't really speak of this issue in in the in this uh, uh, development in the Second World War. That there is not really much to find. Maybe the Polish. Um, Polish um, um, uh, participation in the development of Enigma is deciphering the German German uh, uh, telegraph, but that's maybe that's it. State socialism in forty five to eighty nine. Um, if I come to my three points: security, unity, and modernity. So security and independence is totally uh, dependent on, on, on Moscow. So it's a state of Moscow's grace. So you cannot really speak of independence in those those uh, forty some years. A unity, there is a small communist rulership that secures power by national, uh, partly anti-Semitic policies. So um, this is also something that is dividing the Polish society and leading to the emigration of the last Jews that still lived in the country after World War II. So now the Polish society is virtually homogeneous, but it's also the end of the multi-ethnic state. And culturally, you can compare it to the, maybe to the interwar period um, um, uh, the, the, the achievements are also emancipation and on the, on the in the fine arts, but um, if it comes to um, to to modernity, um, it's lacking behind the West. So this is maybe comparative to to the interwar period, and um, yeah, the positive uh, uh, development. Um, uh, the, of course, although it's part of the of the of the Eastern Bloc, you can talk about something like a security in these years, a feeling of security. There is, of course, a block confrontation, but Poland is part of a larger uh, group, and and um, maybe uh, one would feel as secure in Poland as much as in any other country in Europe by the time. So it's it's. Uh, it's 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 the Cold War. We have to face that. So it's it's it. We rem many of us remember those times. No, um, but if it comes to unity, there is something you can compare to the Second World War as well, because you have a grassroots movement against the communist power, which uh, leads to the building of the solidarity movement, which uh, finally puts an end to communist power in Poland. Yeah, and and uh, about about the cultural developments, emancipation and literature. I've already talked. I'm coming to an end right now and I shed a light now uh, on free Poland and member of the Poland as member of the EU during the last um, 30 some years so if it comes to to uh, security independence of course Russia's attack on Ukraine in 2022 challenges the security of all former members of the Soviet Union or of the Warsaw Pact 
Unity, um, Poland, as you might know, is divided. It's a divided society today between nationalists and universalists. And this reminds me on the situation immediately after the First World War. You have on the one hand the PiS government and you have the civic platform. And uh, the one is very much pro-Poland and ethno-Polish. And the other one is very much pro-EU and multi, multi-ethnic, um, has a multi-ethnic approach. You can also compare this maybe to other countries like, like which we do not compare now, but it, it just comes into mind, for example, the US with re- Republicans and Democrats. So it's a divided society, even families are divided. And there's also... Um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, differences between city against country and and still today almost 40 percent of the polish population still live in rural areas so not 80 percent like 100 years ago but still a large um, a large part of the society if you compare it to other european countries and um, uh, to mod- modernity the homogenization of the society after 1989 as a conservative and catholic has uh, Catholic has set back the country, in my view, um, concerning modern standards of tolerance if it comes to ethnic or sexual diversity. Um, my last point, maybe achievements uh, in those three areas. Poland has finally joined the West, as the majority of the population has been longing for since 100 years. Um, unity, um, Poland is maybe internally div- divided, but it's united now against Russia and pro-Ukraine. That is the development of the last uh, months over the political divide. And modernity, you can say that uh, technically or if it comes to innovation, Poland has has joined the West and is not lacking behind anymore. If you if you look back during the, for the last 100 years to sum up, um, uh, striving for security, independence, unity and modernity is in my eyes, in the Polish case, a dynamic process. Poland has achieved a lot on these fields. Um, during the last 100 years, but all three areas are also bore a potential of conflict as well and are currently, as they always have been, challenged or literally under attack. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Jochen, for this presentation. Can you hear me now? Uh, oh yeah, excellent. That uh, will be very helpful for the discussion. That you can hear me <laughs> uh, later on. Uh, and uh, thank you also for, um, of course, touching on the on the subject of uh, Ukraine, which I'm sure will be coming up in the discussion, uh, if only as a sort of counterexample of a state that also temporarily came into being at the end of the First World War, but then uh, was absorbed into the emerging uh, Soviet Union, only to reemerge after the end of the Cold War. Um, at this point, I would call on Mariana to give uh, her presentation here on uh, Finland before we then move on to Mary Daly with the final presentation. Okay. Um, yes, thank you for inviting me to this uh, to speak at, at this forum and to be part of this this important event. Uh, and I'm especially pleased to be here because comparative history has long been a key interest of, of uh, mine, like um, was mentioned in, in the introduction. I've been involved in, in many comparative uh, projects uh, on European history and especially European urban history since the 1990s and uh, found the comparative approach an invaluable tool when it comes to identifying and uh, analyzing transnational dimensions of our national uh, policies and national histories. Uh, For today's comparative panel discussion, I was asked to identify and present two or three developments from my research that Finland resolved successfully and two or three that were less successful. When I reflected uh, on the task assigned to me, I realized how difficult it is to distinguish between successes and and failures. Successes are rarely complete and uh, the same is true of failures. Failures can have a dramatic and tragic consequences 
but they can also be stepping stones to new achievements. Finland started its journey as an independent country with an unmitigated disaster. Finland declared independence in December 1917, taking advantage of a power vacuum emerging after Russian revolutions. And just over a month later, civil war broke out between the forces of a non-socialist government, the whites, and those of a socialist movement, the reds. The war lasted less than four months, ending in victory for the whites in May 1918. But the war and its aftermath left almost 37,000 people dead and almost 20,000 children orphaned and created a deep political divide in society. I'm not sure whether it's uh, possible to learn from history, but from uh, the ashes of this disastrous war, uh, there seemed to emerge that crucial political will and determination to resolve the country's problems democratically through the political system and by means of dialogue and negotiation. If you think about uh, the new states which appeared on the map of Europe during and after the First World War, Finland and Ireland were the only ones which remained democratic states throughout the 20th century. In other new states, democratic, government, democratic governments collapsed. For example, the Baltic states deteriorated into authoritarian regimes in the 1930s and became part of the Soviet Union after the Second World War. In Finland, too, parliamentary system was sorely tested, in both in the 1930s and 1940s. Between the First and Second World Wars, Finland experienced political turmoil, and it was clearly a more unstable democracy than Ireland. Right-wing and uh, far-right movements were relatively popular in Finland, as in many other parts in Europe and they seriously threatened the young state's democratic institutions. On the far right, Lapua League in particular resorted to illegal activities to achieve its aims. It forced the government uh, to outlaw the Finnish Communist Party and in 1932 the League finally tried to overturn the legal government. This time, however, it had gone too far. The violence and illegal act activities of the League caused it to lose uh, pop its popular support and the legal democratic government was able to stand firm against its totalitarian doctrines and practices. After the Second World War, the Iron Curtain divided Europe. Apart from Finland, maybe I have here, Apart from Finland, all other new states bordering the Soviet Union were either ruled by communist regimes aligned with Moscow, Moscow or became part of, of the Soviet Union. It was feared that Finland would go the same way. The influence of, of the Soviet Union on Finnish politics was significant during the Cold War, but Finland uh, remained an in independent democracy and part of a Western bloc. So to conclude my first point, if a civil war was a disaster, keeping Finland on a democratic path through the 20th century was clearly an achievement. It was by no means a complete success, but nevertheless extremely important. To exactly what extent it was achievement of Finnish decision makers and to what extent it was due to other factors it's, it, it is another question entirely. Then uh, I'll move to discuss economic and, economic and social development. <coughs> 
In the 19th century, Finland and the other Nordic countries had been among the slow starters in Europe. But once the industrialization process was properly in motion, the, econo eco the economy started to grow and societies began to change relatively rapidly. In the interwar period, the former view of the North as a poor but a sympathetic periphery was gradually replaced by a more modern and future-oriented image of the Nordic countries. At the core of this new image was uh, at the core of this new image was partly re a realistic and partly idealized view of the Nordic countries as successful reformers. Countries that developed into modern industrial economies far more quickly than might have been anticipated. This image, image was uh, associ associated, especially, uh, especially associated with Sweden and Denmark. The rest of the Nordic countries, Finland, Norway and Iceland, did not uh, attract similar attention individually. However, in the 1930s, 1940s and 1950s, the Nordic countries came in increasingly increasingly to be seen and presented as a distinctive region with common cultural, social, economic and political structures and traditions. And in this process, also Finland and, and Norway came to be increasingly associated with modernity and progress. It was vitally inform, uh, important for Finland to become a member of this Nordic community. Otherwise, the country would have been isolated from Western Europe. Finnish policymakers were acutely aware of this, and so were policymakers in Sweden and other Scandinavian countries. For example, the strength strengthening of the Nordic communi community was an efficient way to re reduce the influence of the Soviet Union in Finland and in, in Northern Europe in general. The emerging Nordic community also profoundly influenced the way in which Finland built its future and especially its welfare state. Finland's position as a latecomer in welfare development enabled it to learn from others. Finland closely monitored uh, the example of Sweden in many ways, such, such as in the area of social security and social services, in emphasis on full employment and in a high share of uh, GNP on social expenditure. The major expansion of a welfare state in Finland occurred during the uh, 1970s and 1980s, and this process was a defining feature in Finland in the second half of, uh, of the 20th century, becoming part of a grand narrative of national history. There persists in Finnish society a strong consensus in relation to the value of the uh, welfare state. It is perceived as a success story and something we need to safeguard. However, there is a great deal of variation in what people mean by welfare state, whether it's traditional welfare state or more liberal one. And it's also important to emphasize, and this is something we only now uh, discuss and, and research in, in, in Finland, that welfare state always had its outsiders and welfare policies had their, have had their shortcomings. For example, if you look at the decades following immediately, immediately, um, immediately following the Second World War, Finland and, and other Nordic countries were collectivist in a sense that many things were defined from above. And members of these societies were not really expected to exercise their, their own choice. Then my final point. Uh, I'm an urban historian, first and foremost, and therefore I would like to say something about cities and urban policies in Finland. The task uh, the organizers gave us um, was that each historian should identify and present 
developments that the state gets right uh, or wrong. Unlike in Ireland, which was an uh, exceptionally centralized country, in Finland the state was weak, rather weak in the first half of the 20th, 20th century. And one important area in which the Finnish state was particularly weak was urban development. The state was very slow to address difficult urban problems, housing, public health, unemployment, urban planning. In the late 19th century in, and in the first half of the 20th century and even later. The cities had to take uh, the lead in identifying and resolving complex problems. And given the circumstances, they succeeded very well. So well that in the Nordic countries, we um, often use the concept welfare cities. Compared to the state, Finnish cities and towns were more open to the new ideas and new technologies. They were eager to learn from both successes and failures of other European cities. And in, in many cases, they implemented major uh, reforms before problems became too difficult to solve. The change, the change came slowly when we're talking about the state and the state uh, the attitude of state to cities. In the years after the Second World War, the state level decision makers still are stuck with the idea that the future of Finland would lie in the countryside. And therefore, the state policies and resources were often primarily directed toward rural development until the 1960s, but in some cases even later than that. So in this case, case the state got it wrong and cities and the cities got it right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana, uh, for uh, your intervention and also for drawing our uh, attention to uh, the urban dynamics and the role of the state, uh, as well as, uh, I think, reminding us uh, of something that we haven't talked um, perhaps enough about, but which I hope we'll return to uh, during our discussion, namely the centrality of violence, in this case civil war violence, to uh, the early period of state formation, which I think um, perhaps with the exception of New Zealand, applies to um, all of the cases that we're discussing here today and is obviously a sort of common theme uh, that we'll be uh, discussing uh, later on. Uh, now we're moving to Ireland, and uh, given that we are coming to the end of the decade of centenaries, uh, there's no better person to talk about uh, the reflections that we had over the last 10 years than Mary Daly, who's been very much at the heart of the uh, state efforts and discussions to uh, commemorate what happened a hundred years ago. So I'll give you the floor, Mary. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, and thank you very much. I think it's a fascinating event. And I have spent many, many years trying to convince people that Ireland does not have the most traumatic and disrupted history over the past hundred years and therefore uh, and I have so often invoked the Finnish Civil War or particularly uh, the history of Poland. Uh, New Zealand raises just questions of envy about a welfare state which I will return to if only 1930s. Um, so I think this I think this comparative approach is really invaluable to give some perspective to people who get so very hibernocentric on their own history. Uh, like all the other speakers, I find the positive and negative uh, problematic because we've all, I used to for many years tell my students that history was 40 shades of grey, but I had to drop that analogy. <laughs> uh, uh, but you will find in my talk that there is balance one way or the other, except that I'm beginning on, I think, an unequivocal positive note. And that is, like Mariana, Ireland has enjoyed a century as a sovereign democratic state. We are the two 
a, the two triumphant cases that come out of post, the post-Versailles world and the fact that Ireland wasn't even at Versailles except on the fringes even adds to that particular story. But we have to remind ourselves we're now one of the oldest continuing democracies in Europe, which is an admirable status to have. Furthermore, unlike uh, Finland, it was not invaded and nor was it a combatant in war over the past hundred years if we ignore the civil war which ended in the early in 1923. Geography is very important to that benign future like New Zealand, an island uh, and the immediate neighbour Britain having left did never showed any wish to reinvade. Now the US considered invasion briefly in the 1940s but that's another story. Um, Marianne has echoed so many themes that are common to me. The question of democracy. There was no inevitability that Ireland would become a stable democracy, given the origins in revolution and a civil war. A military or even a civilian democracy could not be ruled out. But Irish nationalism had and a very long distinguished tradition of democratic politics, going back to Daniel O'Connell in the early 19th century. Generations of Irish nationalist politicians sat and, and learned their skills at Westminster. And that democratic tradition triumphed. And within a decade, the losing side in civil war took office following an election, and there was no purge eh, that following that event. There were odd instabilities unstable moments, there were a odd moments of uncertainty, but nothing remotely comparable to Finland. And never could you say that the state and the democratic state was in danger at any stage, seriously over the past 100 years, and that is quite remarkable. There are some things that really helped that. I, and I'm going to be bizarre and thank Britain. Proportional representation was introduced in 1920, and perhaps Britain might try it themselves. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, other, the other thing is that the split over the 1921 treaty did create a, a, a two major divided parties. And the combination of those two forces meant that a government did change hands, not infrequently. Before 1914, a majority of seats outside Ulster were not contested in parliamentary elections because only a nationalist could ever win them. So I think these are quite important. A further success over that hundred years was the removal of all residual British authority in Ireland. And that was leveraged through Dominion status. Charlotte has already mentioned Dominion status. And, and Patrick McGilligan, Irish minister, was a central figure in the whole a, a drafting of the Statute of Westminster and the, the implementation of Balfour a Declaration. But what, what the Irish wanted to do was leverage Dominion status to exit from the Commonwealth. A, it, it, it was an unhappy dominion, didn't have any great joy to stay. But the dominions proved very important to Ireland uh, some decades later, following the Declaration of Republic in 1949, which was done in a highly inept manner and caused potential for serious dis dis uh, disagreement with Britain. And it was the dominions, uh, our friends, including New Zealand and Australia, and Ca especially New Zealand, Australia and Canada, who worked and so uh, uh, worked in negotiations to bring us a kind of a peaceful reconciliation between Britain and Ireland following that event. I'm now moving on to economic and social development, which I could quite easily present as either a positive or a negative, though a, at the end of 100 years, the story is very positive. Population decline, emigration and economic failure were commonly invoked as part of the case for an independent Ireland. But for many decades after independence, at least 40, perhaps 50, there were no positive economic dividends from that independence. In 1961, when the population had reached a post-famine low, the Belfast Telegraph published an editorial titled, it was in August 1961, I should say, the, published an editorial titled Fleeing Irish and East Germans, bracketing the two countries as the two failed states of Europe, and to rub salt into the wounds, they emphasised that the rate of emigration from East Germany that forced, that led to the Berlin Wall was lower than the rate of emigration from Ireland at the time. Three years earlier, senior civil servant Ken Whitaker drafted a report which he originally titled, Has Ireland a Future? And he was not being flippant about it. 
1913, while still part of the United Kingdom, Ireland ranked ninth in terms of GNP among 14 European nations. It was more prosperous than Italy, Germany, Greece, Finland, Spain, Portugal, and most places. But for more than 50 years after, sorry, not Germany, but for more than 50 years after independence, its relative standing among independent countries fell in economic terms. By 1985, Ireland's GNP was equivalent to Greece, fractionally above Spain, but had been far outstripped by Finland and Italy. Irish living standards are now on a par with a Germany above France and among the highest in the world. That's only happened since the 1990s. Membership of the EC has been central to the convergence and it's also enabled Ireland over time to break its long-term economic dependence on Britain, which lasted well into the 1970s. By now, it's less than 10% of trade is with Britain. Social indicators begin to improve, but only from the 1970s, generations after Charlotte's wonderful uh, New Zealand. Uh, you get more extensive welfare supports, uh, but never as generous as what Finland can manage because this is a time of economic difficulty. So uh, pluses and minuses you get. Rising participation in higher education, especially from the 90s, one of the highest in the world. Women coming into paid employment really only takes off for married women in the 1980s. And it's only within the past five years that participation rates have risen to something like the EU average. Falling fertility come, kicks in from the 70s and 80s. In, in 1960, for what it's worth, Ireland and New Zealand had the two highest uh, family sizes in, in, the, in the Western world, but uh, Ireland was about 25% ahead of New, New Zealand in terms of, uh, of, of fertility. Life expectancy has only caught up this century and really within the past decade. So it's been a very, very slow improvement. Yet in tw 2022, the population has finally exceeded the 1851 figure. Uh, there are two and a half million people at work. There were just over one million in 1990. Population of rural Ireland, and you were talking about rural and so was Charlotte, is a half a million greater than it was in 1966. In France, it's four million fewer than at that time. Income and, we and wealth disparities, yes, they exist, but they are less unequal. They're, they are less than they were a century ago. 20% of the population was not born on this island, and to date, that has not prompted any noticeable anti-immigration sentiment. The moral censoriousness shown in the past, those who deviated from social and sexual norms, has largely disappeared. So this is very much a good story. But the two ifs are, why did it take so long? And then a slight caveat, it, a, Ireland, I think, has had declined so hard wired into its brain that it hasn't been good at providing for growth in terms of infrastructure, housing, hospital beds, let alone the urban planning that uh, Mariana has just been talking about. And I'm going to finish this positive note with a very sharp negative qualification, and that relates to the care for its emigrants. Over 40% of those born in Ireland in the 1930s and 40s left. Significant numbers left in earlier and later decades. The Irish state consistently did nothing to provide any welfare support for its emigrants. The contrast there is with Italy, who'd been doing it from the late 19th century. This failure to assist emigrants in need was particularly significant in Britain because Britain was easy to reach and it was the destination for the poor, unskilled, badly educated women and men who often were sending money home to support their families. And it was also the destination of those who'd been in institutions such as industrial schools, mother and baby homes, Magdalen homes, prisons, psychiatric hospitals, those rejected by Irish society. Now that has happily changed, but only since the 1990s. And the diaspora unit in the Department of Foreign Affairs is a relatively recent arrival. The most intractable issue facing an independent Ireland was what to do about Northern Ireland or Ulster Unionism. From the 1880s, the most common response of Irish nationalism to Ulster Unionism was to ignore its existence, pretend it wasn't there and maybe it might go away. Articles two and three of the 1937 reflect this rhetor rhetorical fantasy. It asserts that the national territory consisted of the entire island, but for the present legislation will only have effect in 26 counties. Successive governments showed no interest in the Northern Catholic minority, who often looked to them. 
They showed even less interest and awareness or sympathy with Ulster unionism. It was a, the widespread belief was that a united Ireland would be achieved through negotiating between the British and Irish governments and by encouraging the United States and other countries to exert pressure on Britain to a, for unification, not by changing hearts and minds in Northern Ireland. The outbreak of violence in, in 1969 forced the Irish government to actually begin to look towards Northern Ireland and inform themselves about Northern Ireland and its people, and there have been significant advances. Articles 2 and 3 of the Constitution were amended in 1998 following the Good Friday Agreement, and they affirmed the right of people in Northern Ireland to identify as British, Irish or both, and it also changes say, the claim for United Ireland to an expression of a wish for a united people, uh, and uh, that would re respect the direct traditions of, uh, sorry, the distinct traditions of Ulster Unionism. There's been enormous engagement by government, academics, including this academy, and civil society on these issues, and that must be acknowledged. It's not clear that it has percolated through to the popular mind, because recent opinion polls suggest there's a minority of people in favour of a united Ireland, but no willingness to pay higher taxes, amend the constitution, or change the national flag or anthem to secure that. It's almost back to the position of 100 years ago or such. My final topic, which also demands a mature reflection, is the question of Irish neutrality, which has become a central principle of Irish foreign policy and indeed Irish identity, without due reflection on what it really implies. The war in Ukraine and the recent decisions by Finland and Sweden to apply for NATO membership and abandon their neutrality has raised awareness of this issue in recent months. Ireland had no option in World War II other than remain neutral because returning British forces to Ireland less than two decades after independence would have reignited Republican violence. But, and that wartime neutrality does actually lead to a lot of isolation in the immediate post-war decades, not admitted to the United Nations, for example, until 1956. But after the war, Ireland rejected an invitation to join NATO, not for any principled reason. Ireland was viscerally anti-communist, but in a sordid attempt to persuade the United States to put pressure on Britain to, to support reunification. There was no serious debate at the time on neutrality and what it meant, no effort to implement the defence measures found in other neutral countries such as Sweden or Switzerland. In the 1960s, when the Cold War was at its height, neutrality might have threatened the prospect of EEC membership if the EEC had become a more centralised and par powerful entity. And neutrality has re-emerged on several occasions in an EU context, most recently the defeat of the Lisbon Treaty the first time around. Given that Ireland is determined to play a role in global affairs and has an honourable tradition in the United Nations, particularly in peacekeeping and also in development aid, and given the centrality of EU membership to today's Ireland, and this has become much more central since Britain determined to leave the EU, there is an urgent need to confront the question of neutrality. I'm not arguing for NATO membership, I'm not arguing for anything. What I'm arguing for is mature debate and a decision making what a neutrality means, if it continues, and whether it should continue. So on that note, I'll come. Thank you so much, Mary, for this uh, extremely uh, rich talk and also for um, placing Ireland's experience into a uh, global uh, context and also for uh, offering some hard facts uh, in this kind of post-truth environment. And as an empirical historian, I, I do like uh, a couple of hard facts. Uh, now, before we um, move on to the general uh, discussion, uh, I would like to uh, open the floor as the audience still gathering ideas and questions, and uh, I would also like to invite the online uh, audience to submit uh, questions through the uh, chat function if they wish to do so. Um, but I would like to return to one of the many themes that I think uh, were running uh, through the, um, uh, the talks today, and that's the kind of persistence of empire, if you like, in various ways, which uh, different um, terrible political tragedies uh, of late have kind of 
brought back into focus. I mean, be it Brexit, be it the war in, in Ukraine, uh, be it, of course, the, um, the debate about colonial violence, uh, and uh, of course the, the, the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine has not just alarmed people in Poland, but also uh, in Finland uh, itself, a direct neighbor uh, of Russia. So um, I would just be interested to what you feel that this discussion about the imperial roots of uh, the emerging nation states that we've been talking about this afternoon uh, have sort of become a major theme and how through the perspective of your own national case studies uh, you would uh, relate that to debates in, in other countries and perhaps we can just uh, kick off in the same um, sequence that we had our presentations and begin uh, with Charlotte. I'd be very keen to hear and learn a bit more about uh, the uh, current debates in, in, uh, in New Zealand in that respect, and then we can move on to uh, Johan and Mariana and then again return to, um, to Mary. <clears throat> thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you all speakers. Uh, extremely interesting to, to put a comparative picture uh, together. Um, so I think you're absolutely um, right, Robert, certainly from this part of the world. The, um, the long uh, continuing presence and consequences of empire for us, the 19th century imperial encounter, are very central. So um, if you dial into New Zealand public radio, to our parliament, to everyday life, to commercial entities such as Air New Zealand, etc., you will see that what I'm calling addressing decolonization very present. Um, so it, it is, if you like, the central tension uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand at present, uh, so certainly there. Um, and just to um, make a comment about that in terms of, I think, um, Mary, you talked about, uh, apart from New Zealand, all these nation states are born out of violence. Um, well, our violence was was the 19th century colonial encounter. So, so if we just step back slightly earlier than 1922, absolutely. Um, so where there were uh, concerted wars um, in order to uh, establish a, what I call and what's often referred to as the settler state. So, um, yes, I mean, in, in historical and cultural terms, I guess the growth of a national culture, particularly post-World War II, was one about building a national history, expressing a national culture in which empire was very much pushed out the door and not present. Um, but as um, decolonization challenges have re-emerged, empire is very much back in a scholarly, but also very much a uh, political agenda. Johan, do you want to come in on this? Yes, I would like to um, to bring the Polish uh, perspective into the question of the persistence of empire. I think you make a very good point, Robert, here. And um, uh, I have been I've been working on the Polish independence uh, lately and uh, I've re recovered that they, we have a very national discourse in Poland about the independence, especially with the centenary. And on the other hand, if we if we do the historical research on the time before independence, we find that even though Poland had been, yeah, as you might say, even occupied, petitioned by three imperial powers, the 19th century had been a very peaceful one for the for the Polish speaking population in Central Europe. That's just a that's just a fact. Of course there had been some uprising against especially the Russian um partition power. But if you if you see the time from the from the Congress of Vienna in 1814 to the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, um that it was a really peaceful time. And so we have a strong narrative in Poland which is even stronger today um, of, of resistance against imperial powers, but on the other hand, we have a, a hidden history of a, a kind of um, the other side of imperialism, which which also provided some some really. I know that I'm um, <laughs> that I get get a lot of critique in Poland by by, by certain um, uh, groups for this, but but you can say that that the 19th century, in a way, also provided um, the Polish-speaking countries with with a lot of benefits and and the population by then knew it because they were also uh, taking part in the imperial process you know? so 
But this is this is just a side remark. I, what's more important for our last hundred years, so from Polish independence and then occupation and and destruction of the country and then communist power and then again independence, um, uh, is that of course um, the persistence of the empire is is always there. Uh, in the interwar period, as I had to try to 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 uh, carve out in in my ten minutes, it's it's the the Poland is not decided. There is a neighbor to the west, which is Germany, and uh, there is not much sympathy for Germany, especially because of these violent post-war struggles in 1918 to 21, especially in East, East Upper Silesia. On the other side, there's Russia, and that's not loved as well because of the war between Russia and Poland in 1920. And so Poland tries to keep a, a really a very uh, fragile balance between those two, and this doesn't work out because, uh, yeah, as you know, history, uh, Poland, um, Germany, and Russia, they just um, decide in a very imperial act in the in the Hitler-Stalin Pact to just um, agree on, on dividing the country amongst themselves as well. And so the persistence of empire has, has influenced Polish history in the first half of the second, uh, of the 20th century. But I would argue it also, um, um, if I, 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 I will leave out now the state socialism that makes things a little more complicated. I would say it's still an issue today. Yeah, especially if it comes on the one hand to the relation between Poland and the European Union, which is maybe not really seen as an imperial power, but but surely, for sure, in the Polish national nationalist camp, as some some kind of yeah um, uh, danger to the national sovereignty, yeah. And on the other hand, of course, yeah, the Russian attack on on Ukraine, which which puts all that we that we, that we were believing in until nineteen uh, twenty twenty two into question, because now we have another another um, event of an imperial power, which is in the region already uh, active since since uh, the, the uh, centuries. Which is is really turning back history and trying to to um, to annihilate states again. Yeah? And this is uh, when the European Union was an issue in Poland and and the question how much Poland has to give up its sovereignty to be part of the European Union. Um, now this is this is a completely different, uh, of course, um, um, a, a, dif a different um, a degree of of of, of the, the uh, imperialism in. The region. So it, it, it the, the the fall of the empire is the beginning of those one hundred years period, and now the empire rises again. And the very very important question is how Poland will deal with it. And at the very moment, we can see that the um, the indecision between east and west, the fragile balance that we tried to keep in the twenties and thirties, that didn't work out. As I said, now Poland is absolutely inclined to be part of the west and take it. Um, being a, a bridgehead of the West there and also take the, 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 the Western uh, countries and the, the, the European Union as a shield of defense against Russia. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. Now, uh, Finland uh, joining NATO uh, seems to be a, a moment of sort of uh, an imperial shadow um, uh, returning, um, perhaps unexpectedly, but uh, perhaps you want to kind of contextualize yeah, that. I, I think it, I mean, uh, fin uh, Finland is different case from from that of Poland because I mean Finland was part of uh, kingdom of Sweden for six hundred mm. years and then it was a part of uh, Russian Empire for for about uh, hundred years and uh, our situation is different from that that of Poland that uh, there is this. Uh, Problems with Russia or the Soviet Union uh, in in the early twentieth uh, century during the Second World War and now and in all these cases Sweden and this uh, uh, relationship with Sweden and our our you know common interest I mean that uh, at the same time they, be, they become mm. very important. Thank you, Mary. Oh, um, I, I think I have two. I have, I have several points. I've, there's, there's two that I think are worth uh, reflecting on. The first, first is really, and it's it's come through very much in the past decade of commemorative events. Uh, 
the the very substantial Irish involvement in in the British in the British Army, not uh, not just in World War One, but also again in World War Two when Ireland was technically neutral. There is a significant military tradition which goes well back into the nineteenth century, and coupled with that. Um, for a country where jobs were, you know, where there was a shortage of opportunities, the empire, and particularly India, uh, was was quite significant. I mean, I was just thinking when you threw the question at me that Owen McNeill, who the man who didn't, you know, who was the man who who was one of the founded the Irish Volunteers and a key figure in the in the whole movement, uh, he had a brother who was in the Indian Civil Service. So did Paddy McGilligan, uh, who was uh, the architect of 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 of, of the whole. Uh, a, a, you know that that whole bath, bath for, uh, very much involved in that that affair. So a, one thing that came through is that you can get people whose families were, you know, passionate Irish uh, separatists, but some of them actually would have served previously in the British forces, and others will have close family members who remained in those forces. So the interaction between them is quite deep-seated in Irish society. And I think this is, this is part of the complexity of Ireland and Irish peoples that has, you know, that has really been explored in recent times. I mean, you'd know that from a lot of the work on World War I particularly. The other area where I think the empire is really, really important, and this brings me back to Northern Ireland, because, you know, their identification with, with, the, with the empire is actually very strong. And in terms of patterns of emigration, there's less emigration from Northern Ireland than there ha is from here over the past uh, century, but a disproportionate amount of the emigration from Northern Ireland, particularly Ulst Ulster Protestants, or even a, the, the Protestant community in border areas, a disproportionate amount of that emigration will, will go to Canada, to New Zealand, or perhaps to Australia, much less so than, than, than to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and their ad ad affinity with empire you know, is quite strong, particularly into, in, particularly into Canada. And it was a, a Canadian Governor General who put a replica of the cannon uh, that, that destroyed the walls of Derry in the siege, that provoked the, a bad-tempered Irish Taoiseach to, declare, to announce that he was declaring a republic in, in a speech at a dinner in Ottawa, which is a strange thing to do. But the linkage between, uh, Ulster, particularly if you look at Ulster, uh, Ulster diaspora, Ulster, Ulster unionist diasporas, uh, and their family networks, they are very, very heavily embedded in, in the Commonwealth. Uh, so, and this is something that I think it, you have to think of in, term, in, 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 in terms of Irish identities, mm -hmm. and not, but not just in Ulster and not just Protestant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we have about seven minutes before I need to hand over back to the uh, president. So I would uh, open the floor at this point. Um, maybe we collect a couple of questions and then we do one more round of, um, of responses. Uh, I also have a first uh, online question here from uh, Roshin Healy. Uh, which I might read out first, and then uh, whoever has a question can raise their hand, of course. Um, and she wants to know how well uh, each state has managed immigration uh, in, in recent years, obviously as one of the um, big uh, topics at the moment, whether the states have been willing to uh, adopt to a more open approach to national identity than uh, used to be the case historically. Uh, and I think, I suspect we're going to have very different answers here uh, from uh, our speakers. Um, are there any other questions from the floor? Yes, the, the gentleman in the back. Um, empires is a theme that I'm just going to follow through on. Empires are very good at drawing lines on maps. And with possibly the exception of New Zealand and Professor Daly has touched upon the lines left on Ireland with the empire. There were lines also left in Finland and in Poland. Uh, after the Finnish Civil War, the loss of Karelia, and after Second World War, the significant loss of population that Poland faced. These did not become as big an issue as it did, let's say, in Ireland and in some other parts of the world I can think of. Would, can we have some more light on why it didn't become a big issue in the 
post-partition, if I might call it that, states of Poland and Finland, these lots of territory and peoples. Thank you very much indeed. Is there one more question anyone wants to raise? Otherwise, I would invite... Yes? Yes, um, good evening. Is it working? Oh, right, very good, very good. Good evening. Um, I'd like to pick up on something Mary Daly said uh, a few moments ago regarding Ireland's links with the old uh, Commonwealth. And it's always an ongoing issue here uh, regarding Commonwealth support or support for membership of the Commonwealth in the Republic in that there is always a minority of support for it, but the majority, it seems, that are not so much for it. And regarding what had been mentioned uh, with concerning the old dominions, it's amazing to me that over the last decades, there's been very little discussion in Ireland uh, among our politicians as to whether they should have somewhat greater affinity if they're not member members of the Commonwealth, if we don't wish to pursue that course, whether they might consider a greater uh, association with the old dominions, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, in some way or other. And America, of course, is the um, first empire um, of Britain, but they, those four countries together do comprise members of the what's known as the Five Eyes uh, Intelligence Network globally. And it seems to me a natural grouping, which Ireland, despite its many close links to Europe, which I hope are firmly maintained in the future, uh, particularly with regard to Poland and the fact that many Poles arrived here in Ireland in the mid noughties I'm glad to say many of them are still here. They've considerably strengthened our society in this last um, 10 or 15 years. And equally so... Yeah. Respond because we're running out okay. of time. My, Thank my you very point, much. I'll leave it with you. Thank um, Charlotte, we'll start with you. You can pick whichever aspect you'd like to comment on. So I'll be very brief, but just uh, I'll just pick up on a response to that last comment. So um, I think it's a very interesting question. I think that is there is certainly some movement in that greater association with what we might refer to as the old dominions. So in in the last um, perhaps five years, perhaps slightly longer, there has been um, separate diplomatic representation in both Wellington and in Dublin for, for both Ireland and New Zealand to have uh, separate and independent representation in each other's countries. Uh, so I think that is a sign of some greater association that's happening there. Johan, do you want to comment on the, on the lines of the map and the question yeah. of immigration? Most definitely so. First of all, um, if it comes to um, the loss of population, I would say, first, I would tackle first that question. Um, the, the history of Poland is, is unbelievable in the 20th century and what the country had suffered and to go through. And I couldn't go into details in my intervention, and I will not now, uh, because there's no lack of time, but but really to keep in mind and what, what the question um, also um, um, uh, addressed is the shift of Poland in 1945 of 250 kilometers from the east to the west. The whole country, the whole territory, the, 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 the borders had been shifted. Yeah, And so, of course, that means that on the one hand, Poland gained territories in the west, um, on the cost of Germany, which had to give them away because it lost the war and had uh, committed heinous crimes in, in Poland and other uh, occupied countries all over Europe. And on the other hand, Poland lost enormous territories in the east to the Soviet Union, which once had been a part of Imperial Russia in the 19th century, one has to be uh, reminded, but of course before the partitions there, and then you can go back in history for centuries, etc., who belonged what, that doesn't lead to anything. but. The important point is, the question is why why this um, this loss of population in the East, especially of Polish speaking population has not been so much talked about. First of all, the Polish speaking population was giving an opportunity to move West with the frontiers. So there was an, an, a huge program and also a, for, a program of forced immigration from those lost territories in the East to the 
to the uh, country that has shifted to the to the west. The question why it hasn't been a big issue, at least um, officially in Poland, in communist Poland after 1945, was obvious because this was a move of Poland to the West. It was um, more or less um, um, a, a, a Soviet policy of, of, of the Soviet Union. So and the Soviet Union was was uh, holding also uh, its its power in in Poland with the communist regime in Poland so it was it was not very uh, popular to speak loud about about these um, sufferings that had been caused by the by the re uh, re replacement and deportation of people from the east to the west and also by the loss of populations that had stayed in the east, this is a wound that is still open in Poland today, and a, and a kind of nostalgia for the lost territories in the east. You can compare it what 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 Germany also um, witnesses if it comes to the lost territories of Germany in the east, which have become Western Polish territories. A short comment on the question on immigration and how Poland deals with it today. Um, you might all be aware of, it has been also in the news, of course, during the last years of the Polish stance towards the, the wave of, of um, immigrants that came to Europe in, in the mid-2010s, uh, so, so seven, six years ago. Poland, with its very conservative uh, government, had a quite harsh stance um, blocking immigration to Poland, saying that uh, there shouldn't be any any solidarity between European countries. Poland couldn't take uh, immigrants and so on. So it had a very unpopular role in the European Union if it came to immigrants from the Near East, uh, and they have been under uh, under attack and critic for the, for this stance, and I think rightly so. But on the other hand, what you see right now is a wave of solidarity for the immigrant for the fugitives that come from Ukraine. And this is unbelievable. I haven't witnessed it myself, but students from my university in Jena, they have been helping at the Polish-Ukrainian borders during the last month and uh, and and at the at the central station in Warsaw, where where every day um, people coming from the Ukraine came in. And it's not it's, this is not only a state effort. It is an effort that comes from the whole Polish society. Uh, to help um, uh, people that uh, come from Ukraine and uh, without any regard if these people will stay or not. This is a really, uh, this is a different um, different um, ap approach. And of course, we can discuss um, how ethic it is to block out the one kind of immigrants and then leave in the other kind. But still, you can see there are two, po two, two, um, two sides of the matter. <clears throat> Thank you, Johan. Mariana Mary, are there any points that you'd like to respond to in, in the final moments? Yeah, just a small <laughs> point. Uh, uh, in, in Finland, when Finland um, uh, lost uh, Karelia, it just lost the area. All the people who lived in those areas, they, they moved to other parts of Finland. So we didn't lose any population. Well, I suppose just simply under partition, people could, I mean, there's always been free movement uh, within the island. But um, ex except that in the 1940s, Northern Ireland put labour permits in place. And it was a, it, it is a particular grievance among older uh, border Protestant communities that their freedom to move to Northern Ireland was, was they could not move freely to Northern Ireland and, and take jobs. They had to go through a system of restrictions that were there into the late 70s. In terms of Ireland and immigration, I really was terrified when we had a serious recession post-2008 that there would be an anti-immigrant backlash given that a lot of people were losing jobs and everything. It didn't happen. And it, that was wonderful. It is indeed uh, very uh, remarkable. Um, at this point, I uh, need to bring proceedings to a close, but not without uh, thanking uh, our speakers and uh, also particularly to our remote speakers who won't even be able to join us for refreshments or, or dinner afterwards, as is customary. Uh, nonetheless, we are extremely grateful for your contributions. And with that, I'll uh, hand over to the president of the academy. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, very quickly, I know we have all been fascinated by all the points that came up tonight. And indeed, uh, it's a pity that we have to, to terminate and to say goodbye to, um, to Charlotte and, and indeed to, uh, to Jochen over in uh, Germany. Um, as someone who was fortunate enough to live in Warsaw for four years and work there, uh, I was 
would have loved to have gone into some of the complexities and the comparators that came up tonight, but we just we just didn't have time. So um, I, I think it's been wonderful. I would like to thank our secretary, uh, Mary O'Dowd, for organizing uh, this discourse. And to say to you that we are continuing also with a slightly different uh, Central European theme, because our next discourse will be on um, Thursday, the 7th of October at 12 noon in the Academy. And that's going to be a public con conversation uh, between uh, Professor Michael Ignatieff and, um, and uh, Ben Tonra, one of your colleagues from UCD. Michael Ignatieff, as you probably all know, uh, is the president um, of the uh, Central European yeah. University yes. that yes. had to actually move from Hungary to, uh, to Vienna. So we are very fortunate that he's going to talk to us here and have a public conversation about um, academic freedom. Mm -hmm. So I do invite you all to, uh, to come along or to join online, because we're going to have, a, I think, a very full house for that. And we'll be back in our newly restored uh, members room for that event. The details of that will be on the Academy website at www.ria.ie. And as I say, uh, if you can't get tickets for it, then please, uh, please do join us online for that. Those of you who are here are welcome to join us for refreshments. Unfortunately, we cannot extend that invitation, so we'll have to toast you uh, virtually, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you.